Hey, good evening. Can you guys stand with us? We're going to worship tonight. Holy Spirit, we welcome you in this place. King of glory, come and have your glory. Come and have your way. Begin to stir our hearts with hunger for you, Jesus. Stir our hearts to partner with what you're already doing up in your kingdom realm tonight. Holy Spirit, we surrender. We turn our hearts in surrender to you. Jesus, we put you in the highest place. Jesus, 
Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaking, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Cause He's never let me down. He's So why would he fail now? He won't. Yeah, he won't. He won't, he won't. Oh, he won't. Oh, yeah. I still got joy. I still got joy in chaos. I've got no sense so I won't be going under I'm not held by my own strength cause I built my life on Jesus he's never let me down he's faithful through every season so I Rain came, rain came, wind blew When my house was built on you I'm safe with you I'm gonna make it through Rain came, wind blew When my house was built on you Safe with you, I'm gonna make rain came, rain came, rain came. Wind blew, and our house was built on you. I'm safe with you, I'm gonna make it through. Everything around me is shaking I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus Cause he's never let me down He's faithful through generations So I
king Oh Jesus
together 
The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord, the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He is powerful. He is mighty. He is glorious. He is enthroned in majesty and light. Jesus, even now, seated at the right hand of the Father, your throne exploding into thunders and lightnings. There's fire in your eyes. There's passion for your bride. And the purposes of God are crashing down on earth for such a time as this. Come on, give him praise. You have permission. <laughs> God is good and all the time. We've felt for much of this year, or at least I've felt, I'll speak for me, the spirit of God percolating over these next three months or so. Hence, you know, I, I don't really care if we name events or gatherings, or whatever you, you know, we're supposed to do that because it, it helps, I guess. But I feel like we're coming back into this place where we feel like anything is possible. That God really is moving in a way that is unmistakable for us. Now we sing this song sometimes it says, let us become more aware of your presence. That's usually the greater issue. It's really, God moving is usually less of an issue than, than what we think it is. It's our awareness of what, it, what he's actually doing. There's things, there's circumstances of life, stuff that we do, things that we get distracted by, thicken the walls of our soul, our mind, our will and emotions. And then suddenly we don't sense him the way that we used to. It's usually not his problem. But every once in a while, this God who is all together lovely, all together beautiful, all together worthy, he steps down into our midst to cause his goodness to forcefully blow over our faces so that we wake up to what it is that he's already doing. I love what God is doing around the world. I, I love the things that, that we get to engage in here at the Bridge Metro West, the things that I get to engage in, but my heart is for New England. This is my stomping grounds. We're real aggressive here in New England. I, mean, I don't know if you are, I am. That's why I, I like the scripture, you know, the voice of God, it breaks stuff. I like it when things break, things blow up within reason. I'm just thinking about my roof right now. My roof is leaking. I don't like that, but maybe it's a prophetic sign that the rains of God are penetrating into the house. All the intercessors and prophetic people are like, yay! I expect to see you all on my roof tomorrow. Just lay hands on it and pray. But it's a privilege to be here. It's a privilege to work this ground. You know, I know what they say around the country, and I don't know if they still say that because I don't pay attention. You know, New England's a minister's graveyard and all that. Fine, if that's where I go to die, that's fine. But in New England, we know who family is. 
When someone's been touched by the reality of the presence of God, the fire of his presence, like you just know, when you meet someone, when I meet a pastor or a leader, like I just know, oh, this is family. I like that here. And there's something in the history of this land that God is going to build upon, not recycle and redo, but build upon in this day. I really believe this. I really, there, I really believe this. And that's why we're doing what we do. You know, we're not, we don't do events just to do events. It's like extra work and stuff. But it's because we love this ground. I love this ground from Maine to Rhode Island, I guess Connecticut. <laughs> from Connecticut. I love you too, I do. So go Red Sox. Felipe just moved to Boston from New York City. He doesn't know what hit him. But I've seen revival touch this ground. That I believe he's going to do again. Unmistakable presence of God, the sovereign. I want to be at the center of a sovereign move of God that awakens, revives, renews, transforms, reforms this region and this culture. What's the metric? When the culture begins to exude that first foretaste of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, and peace, then we know that God is... Well, maybe we know that the people of God are finally truly walking in the beauty of obedience. Because this divine power has actually given you already everything that you need for life and godliness according to your knowledge of him. He's empowered you, he's enabled you. And if you don't feel that way, well, by the end of this weekend, you will. And then he will say to you, go forth and do likewise. Greater things than whatever you see this weekend, you will do. If you walk in the light as he is in the light. Man, there's, you don't even know your capability. You don't even know the beauty that resides in you, the possibility that resides in you because we're participators in his divine nature. We are co-heirs in Christ. He has made you worthy. He has given you the divine right because of the cross. On the other side of the cross, everything changes. You're no longer someone who's doing better than you deserve. You're probably not doing as well as you ought as a royal child of the king. And your circumstance is irrespective. One of the glorious moments of the apostles' lives was when they were in prison at midnight. And what do they decide to do? They have a worship party. And then the earthquakes and the chains fall off and prison doors open. And they run out. No, they don't run out. They stay. Why? Because they lived in radical obedience and they saw a greater purpose than their comfort and their freedom in the moment. And then a jailer and his entire family are saved and baptized. Man. I want to see a bunch of, I was going to say jailed people, but I don't really want to see that. I don't really want to see that. I just want to see a free people acting as though they are free and living up to the letter of John that says, as he is now, so are you on this earth. So shine with his glory and live from his grace because it's sufficient for you. His love endures forever. And his mercies are new every morning. So if you don't feel his mercies, well, guess what? Tomorrow morning, it's a new day. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to you guys. Would you give the worship team a hand? They're awesome. <laughs> Love these guys. And um, if it's your first time here at the Bridge Metro West, we want to give you a special welcome, your first time family. You know, we don't do visitors here. You're just family. We're just family hanging out. Sometimes people will call and say, well, what's the theme of your conference? And I'm like, we're not doing a conference. We're just hanging out. We're just going to hang out and do family. We're going to open the doors, and we're going to see what God does. And Ken happens to be here this weekend hanging out with us. So we're, our eyes are, at least my eyes are not on Ken. They're on him, the one who is above all things, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Oh, I just go off in Scripture, but because I love it. 
The, the, our vocabulary for, for worship and adoration, it's like it's endless. When you connect with him and you're rooted in his word, it's, it's like you don't run out of things to say. And when you do run out of things to say, you still have Jesus. That works too. So we want to welcome you. Uh, you know, our, our building, if you get lost, just kind of keep walking around in, in a circle or a square. And you'll find everything that you need. The, if you go down the hall and take a right, the bathrooms are at the end of the hall, kind of into the kitchen area. Um, the Ken's product table, which is abundant, but which shall be depleted by the end of this weekend, in Jesus' name, um, is in the back corner. My sister Lisa is over there. I was going to say manning, womaning, the, whatever, whatever. She'll help you. She's well-versed and stuff. Uh, she's working the table. So um, we have a, a couple things coming up. And as a matter of fact, just uh, yesterday, uh, I was on the phone with a, a gentleman by the name of Prophet Doctor. I guess is that the old Prophet Doctor? Is it Doctor Prophet Bernard Taylor? He's from Ghana. He was just at our our good friend family church. Yes, about fifteen of us saw him. Uh, Manny Daphne uh, Daphnis down in Brockton. I will forever call him Daphne, but um, at Restoration Church there, and uh, Ajay and I went down Saturday night, and here's what I'll say about him, because we've seen a lot of gifting. I've seen a lot of gifting. I've seen a lot of words of knowledge, all this stuff. Number one, I was struck by his humility and his knowledge of the word. Also, I have never seen more accuracy and a prophet in my life. I, I and I don't want to, I, I want to, no, I want to emphasize that, but I want to emphasize his humility and his knowledge of the word because we really value character. So as I'm seeing a prophet move and they're gifting, I'm looking at how they interact with people. Are they interacting with love? How are they behind the scenes, aside from the scenes? How are they interacting with me? He moves in love, he's humble, and he knows the word. And I have never seen a prophet move with greater accuracy. And some of you who know our history and know, you know my history, that's no small thing to say. I've been in a lot of meetings with a lot of old dogs and young dogs. And so um, he was in prayer uh, two days ago think and uh, for eight hours because that's what Africans do we, sh we could probably take a page from that book but uh, not all Africans do that but you know they, they can go in and he came out of that and he told my friend that he felt like the Lord was telling him to come back to Massachusetts in September so he had some dates and the dates for me you know I'm in LA that week so I wasn't sure but I was seriously considering canceling the trip so I got on the phone with him. he actually called me and um He's coming back to the States in November, and you know, I said, okay, let's book that first week. Well, our senior prophet, Verna Brookins, got up on Sunday, and our service just kind of blew up on Sunday morning, and she began to prophesy, and she began to prophesy specifically about September 15th. Maybell, who's here, she, uh, I don't know if she's here tonight, but she uh, transcribed the whole word, because I couldn't hear all of it um, from where I was standing. So I, I asked him, I said, well, what are you doing September 15th? And I, he said, well, I'm, you know, I'm scheduled to, to go to Florida and minister in Florida. I said, oh, okay. And then he stopped for a few seconds and he said, but I will do what you ask me to do. Wow. Which, you know, I mean, you think that's awesome and great, but then you start to feel kind of the weight of you. Oh, oh I, I'm, I'm going to tell the brother to do I don't, <laughs> You know what I mean? Well, I don't want that responsibility. <laughs> what if God wants to move in Florida too? I don't care. I love New England. Hey, come to the bridge. We both felt the counsel and the weight of the Lord on it. And so he's going to be here September 15th. We're going to be doing Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. Um, I invite you and encourage you to come. Because God wants to bring healing to the land, but healing particularly to also the, the wounded eagles that are in this region. And this, this region is littered with wounded eagles. By that I mean just wounded prophets. Look, your calling is legitimate. Your calling is true, and God wants to reconnect you to your identity and your destiny for such a time as this. And so that's what we're doing. So that'll be coming up. 
We have other things going on, schools going on. We've got Roar Academy, which trains you to really see how God can use you right in the sphere of culture that you're in, gives you some historical context for Reformation, not, I'm not talking about Martin Luther King, but really reforming culture like Will, William Wilberforce, who, who eradicated slavery in England through the Clapman Group. And we give you some history, but also bring that strategy into the now. So we do that with Roar Academy. We do that with Wagner University. If you want more information, uh, you can ping us here at the church. We'll, we'll connect you. And, uh, and then Ken has his Orbis School of Ministry, which is absolutely phenomenal. If you just want some practical, but like crazy deep instruction on how to navigate the ways of the Spirit, lay hands on people, bring healing, bring deliverance. Um, how many students have you had go through Orbis at this point? Depends which way you measure it. But... Give me the big number. We're, we're a prophetic church. Nineteen thousand students. That's a lot. Like even if you cut that in half, that's a lot. That's a lot of students. So, um, and we, our ministry teams here. Most of our ministry teams have have gone through at least one of the classes. As a matter of fact, uh, his courses are also used as electives for Wagner University. So. Um, with that said, uh, we're going to probably receive an offering for Ken a little bit later, I think. But I want to call you up and let's pray over him and bless him. He got here just in time today. Just in time. Ken is a friend. And a friend of God. Uh, stretch out your hands toward Ken. Hey. Father, we come to you from the sacred space of the name Jesus, Yeshua, the one who is so anointed. We call for your spirit who is holy to come. We give you that. I know you're here. I know that you move. We, we, we feel you already, but you delight in invitations. King of glory, have your glory. Would you blow your winds in this place? And would you blow your goodness over Ken right now? That same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, dwelling inside him, quickening his mortal body, even now, God. Lord, this word that you have burned inside of him in that space of creativity and sovereignty of your nature, oh God, we just call that forth here tonight in this place. But even more than that, God, we speak the full measure of the blessing of this house upon Ken, upon Beth, upon his children, down through the generations, God, that he would leave this place more refreshed than when he came. We are just hanging out and doing family, and family loves family, and Ken is family. We receive him as a father in the faith. We receive him as an apostle in the faith. We even acknowledges his prophetic gifting in the faith and what an extraordinary teacher he is, the gift he is to the body of Christ. For this time, Lord, we need men of God like this in America. So in the presence of men and angels and before your throne, God, we speak blessing, blessing, blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Now would you give Ken Fish a mighty New England welcome. There's that. Make sure it's turned on. Hi, everybody. Good evening. How are you? Grand. We used to sing this song, Ain't It Grand to Be a Christian, Ain't It Grand. Does anybody remember that song? It's kind of cheesy, but anyway, we sang it, for better or worse. Give me a second, I'm getting myself set up here. Um, I don't have any merch to show you tonight, other than just to mention that we have copies of my book uh, on the back table. I, I left the house with more than I brought here, because I had one stop along the way, and we sold a bunch uh, there. So when they're gone here, they're gone. You can still buy them online or from our online store. Uh, but if you want me to sign your book, you got to get it here. And I'm, I'm not even sure how many we have, but it's not a lot. It might be in the range of maybe 20 or thereabouts. Everything else went. So um, give me just a second here.
So um, Paul and I usually sort of predecide approximately what I'm going to talk about. I, I don't know if we actually got that done very well this time, but the last iteration of it was to talk about breaking through to purpose. So something in that space is <laughs> what we're going to talk about. Um, and uh, I just want to, uh, <clears throat> I want to, I want to talk about that breaking through to purpose in the context of the current hour because it doesn't really do much good to talk about it in the abstract. So if you've, if you've got your Bibles, um, open them to the book of Joshua chapter 1. And we're going to start reading at verse 1. And it reads this way, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of... Now most people are going to say none like the flying nun. But if you were speaking good Hebrew, you'd say the son of Nun. So Joshua, the son of Nun, Moshe's assistant, Moshe, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel, or Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness in this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, to the great, great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And Joshua commanded the officers of the people, pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, prepare your provisions, for within three days you are to pass over this Jordan to go in to take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Well, I want to talk about purpose, but uh, the message tonight is called Crossing a line of demarcation. And this is a message that was, at least the bones of it, uh, was very important when uh, the Australian revival was going on in the last decade and I was rattling around loose in all kinds of stations and cow towns and little seaside villages all around Australia's perimeter. Um, but I've, I've reworked this message for the current hour, so some of the concepts are the same, but it's not just a retreaded tire. So, when we talk about a line of demarcation, what is that? Well, it's something that separates two entirely different states of nature. And a line of demarcation may be physical, it may be geographical, it may be a location. So, for example, on the Korean Peninsula, there is a line of demarcation known as the demilitarized zone. And north of it is North Korea, and south of it is South Korea. And uh, you could hardly define two more different societies even though they speak the same language because North Korea is a communist dictatorship the people live in poverty uh, they don't have enough electricity they don't have enough food and something like 60 percent of the people are held in prison camps something like that wow. yeah I mean there's some dispute of the numbers but you can go look around on the internet but it's an enormous percentage South Korea is a modern functioning democracy with all of the strange things that go on in democracies and uh, you know there is great wealth um, the per, per capita GDP is about ten times in the south what it is in the north um, so it, it is a very distinct line as it were in the sand when you cross the DMZ and by the way anyone who tries to cross the DMZ usually gets shot unless they do it right at the the one checkpoint that it's kind of the place where they let people go through but otherwise both sides are very careful to, to reinforce that line of demarcation if you go around the world and you go to the island of Cyprus there is a line of demarcation that runs north-south um, on the island of Cyprus and on the one side of it you have 
the Greek side where people speak Greek and they're following Greek culture and on the other side is the Turkish side and the United Nations enforces a line of demarcation between the Greek and the Turk side and it's been this way as long as I can remember. I mean, I, I don't know when I first became interested in world politics, but I can remember watching footage of that line of demarcation on Cyprus when there was conflict going on between the Turks and the Greeks. I, I might have been eight or nine years old, I don't know, but I mean, it was, it was a long, long time ago. So, as I say, lines of demarcation, they can be physical. They're not always physical, though. Sometimes lines of demarcation revolve around world events, uh, the passing of a leader, or other things like this. So when we talk about this particular story and this line of demarcation, we're talking about a transition. And oftentimes those transitions occur in times of sorrow or difficulty. It might be the death of a loved one. It could be a move, maybe a move you wanted to make, but in retrospect you rethink it. Uh, other times it might be a move that you're forced to take. Uh, your company is closing the factory or the office or whatever it is that you, you know, call your place of employment, and they want you to go to wherever this other facility is, and so you consider your options, you maybe look at your own age, and you think about what's your employability, and you decide it's better to stick with the devil you know than the one you don't know, and uh, off you go to this new world that isn't really what you wanted, but here it is, and so now you've got to gut it out. I knew some people that went through such a line of demarcation back at the Anaheim Vineyard many, many years ago. Uh, their company wanted them to move to Georgia, and they ended up living in a you know nice upscale suburb of Atlanta, and they were miserable their entire life there. And after 20 years, when he finally retired, they immediately picked up and moved back to California. So. You know, these things are not always easy. They're not always, um, sometimes you struggle with them for years. A line of demarcation might be graduation, maybe from high school or college. It could be the loss of a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a spouse. Maybe there's a death, maybe there's a divorce. Maybe you kind of are happy for that divorce, or maybe you're not. Uh, maybe you were left behind or uh, there was an adulterous situation that occurred. So there's all kinds of circumstances that can go on um, with lines of demarcation and they can even be national and international events. And of course anybody who's familiar with prophetic circles knows what that's about. Um, Bob Jones prophesied uh, a particular World Series win as I remember, it was 1989. But, but there have been many things like this that people have used. So it's important for us to recognize as we say all this, though, that not every single historical event or every single epoch of life is a line of demarcation. Sometimes things just sort of come and go. The seasons come, the seasons go, generations rise and fall, and this is the way it goes. And I think one of the risks in the prophetic world is that everybody wants to put meaning on every single thing, and some of that results in rather shallow prophesying. But when it's real, it is actually quite real. So here we are, Moses has died, and Moses was the leader of Israel. In fact, he'd been the leader of Israel for 40 years. And of course, anybody who's a leader for that long leaves an indelible mark on that generation and the one behind it because they're, they're a towering presence. They, they sort of define everything by the work that they do. And of course, Moses most famously had brought the law to the people of Israel. Now, modern Bible scholars will say that he wrote the law. That's actually not quite right. The Bible says God wrote the law with his own finger on tablets of stone. But Moses implemented the law through the statutes and the regulations and so forth. And he, I don't think he ruled with an iron fist, but he ruled with a steady hand. That's not quite the same thing. Um, and with that, he established a kind of culture and a way of life among the people of Israel that they needed to have established because they had come out of 430 years of slavery. And all they knew was to live as slaves and worship Egyptian gods right alongside of the one true God whom they barely knew. And so this was the, this was the nature of the, uh, of the impact that Moses had had on this nation. And so <clears throat> the scripture tells us of Joshua, of course, that he had served Moses since his youth. And at 
when Moses would go into the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, as we say, um, Joshua would frequently remain behind and would pray while Moses got off to the business of the day. And so Moses was not only the lawgiver to Israel, he was uh, Joshua's mentor, and we might even say that he was Joshua's spiritual director. And now, with Moses gone, Joshua had to step up. And everything that had been poured into him, uh, everything that he knew, everything that, was, that he could draw upon, now it was being called upon. And so when we talk about breaking through into purpose, what we're really doing is we're talking about finding that purpose for which we were created, that one thing. And he reminds me of the movie City Slickers. Anybody see that where Billy Crystal's talking to the guy who's Curly? I can't remember who played Curly, but he's a bald-headed cowboy. And they're sitting by the campfire, and Billy Crystal makes a comment to the effect of, what's it all about anyway, Curly? And Curly goes, you know, every, every summer I have a bunch of you city slickers come out from the city. It could be Boston, but it turned out they were from New York. And uh, you're all looking for meaning. You're all looking for purpose. And, and Curly looks at Billy Crystal and he says, uh, and it's this. And Billy Crystal says, it's what? And he goes, just one thing. And Billy Crystal says, well, what's the one thing? And Curly says, that's for you to figure out. <laughs> but you know, that's the nature of modernity, isn't it? Everybody's looking for meaning. Everybody's looking for significance. And I think we know a few things as Christians, but we don't always put the pieces together. And one of the things that has to do with purpose is this, and it's, a, it's an ironclad, non-negotiable, foundational principle of life, not just Christianity. And it's this one. Here it comes. I'm about to give it to you. Ready? It's a slow pitch softball. I'm winding up. I'm about to give you the pitch. Here comes the ball. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. And everywhere I go in the world, and the number of places is growing, <laughs> going to and fro through the earth and up and down upon it, um, only the biblically literate get that joke. Um, people are looking for, they're looking for that one thing. They're looking for purpose. They want to know, what is it that I am, what I am made for? What am I trying to break through unto? And, of course, you and the Lord have to work that out. Now, a prophet might call you out and help define that with a prophetic word. But at the end of the day, the prophet can prophesy it, but if you don't embrace it and own it, it will amount to nothing. It will be words that fall to the ground. <clears throat> but this idea of living your life, I won't even say primarily, solely unto the glory of God is actually the foundation and center point of breaking through to purpose in your life. And what most people do, at least in American and Western society, is they play footsie with that idea. They don't actually live their life wide open for the Lord. I just did a podcast, I think it was yesterday, or maybe it was two days ago, um, with a guy uh, named Jimmy Seibert, and it'll be released in a week or two. Um, just watch for it. Our podcast is called God is Not a Theory. And it's available in Apple and Google Play and Spotify. And it's supposed to be on Charisma, but someone dropped the ball and we're getting that fixed. And it'll be on YouTube if you go look for it. But the, the thing that I want to say about, about this podcast is Jimmy Seibert's a guy that the Lord arrested him when he was young. Uh, he was you know, a college hooligan doing all the things that people do in college. And he just got arrested by God. And he has lived his life solely unto the glory of God. And I know Jimmy, or he wouldn't have been on my podcast. And he, um, he's a remarkable guy. But the thing that, that defines his life right now is that he leads what I consider to be the finest and most successful uh, church planting and evangelism movement in the entire Western world, period, full stop. No exceptions, no qualifiers. And when you hear him talk about the things that drive their culture and how they live, one thing that's right in the center of it is, is focusing entirely on the Lord. And a lot of people don't do that. We get, it's, it's a particular trap 
in America anyway, but I would say countries like Australia, their per capita GDP is higher than ours. They have less people, but the amount of money per person that they make on average is way higher than the United States. Or countries like Germany and France and Switzerland. Um, one of the great risks that we run is as we find success in life, our singular focus and intention on the Lord becomes diluted. And suddenly we're interested in that upgrade in our housing or which car or what vacation or which clothing or we get all these other things that sort of come in around the edge and pretty soon we are no longer seeking first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. And suddenly we're chasing things that we can't find. If you seek the kingdom first, all the other pieces of life seem to fall into place. But people don't, they don't take that at face value. They literally don't believe it. And I know that this problem of unbelief is gigantic in the West. I'm actually going to talk about the problem of unbelief this weekend, but it's a different message. We won't go there right now. But um, the scripture says this in the book of Deuteronomy, written by Moses. It says in Deuteronomy 8.18, 8, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. And then it goes on, it says, but if you forget the, uh, the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. Now perish has a lot of meanings. It might mean literally to die, i.e. your enemies may overtake you. And in that time, that was a particular risk because you know, laying siege to a city and putting everybody in it to the sword, that went on. We may not have quite that acute of, an, of a risk living in modern America, but there are a lot of people who are perishing in the midst of their wealth, in the midst of their careers, in the midst of their vacations, in the midst of their whatever it is. And again, they haven't broken through to purpose uh, because they don't realize that the singular purpose for which they were made is to serve the Lord. And the only question is, in which way do you do that? And that's, that's consistent with your gifts and the shape of your personality and uh, kind of how you react to things in life. And then, he, and then he goes on and says, Like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you, so shall you also perish, because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. So that's out of the mouth of Moses. And Moses is the guy who had trained Joshua, as I just said. And so Joshua, Joshua is being called upon now at this time with Moses off the scene. And all he's got really is, well, he's got God himself. That's not bad. But the question is, can he stick with that? And that's its own question. You know, Eric Metaxas likes to talk about um, you, have a, you have a republic if you can keep it. Well, you have a relationship with God if you can keep it. But many people can't, and there's many things that want to distract us from all of that. And so Joshua, as they say, is on the burner. He's got to figure out, okay, what am I going to do here? And he has to step up, and everything that he's learned is now going to be called upon. And so even in the midst of a sad moment, even a potentially disastrous one, because remember, at this time, Israel is a nation of maybe about 6 million people. The scripture clearly states 600,000 men on foot went up uh, out of Egypt, and there would have been a comparable number of women because men and women are born in normal population groups that are unadulterated in about equal numbers. So 600,000 men means 1.2 million adults, and then you put men and women together and children come about. And so we don't know how many children they would have had. Yeah, we don't know how many children they would have had, but... This could easily have been in the neighborhood of four to six million people that we're talking about. And they're not living behind a wall in a city. They're looking for a land that God has promised them, and they've been living in the wilderness for 40 years. Now remember, Moses is the strategist. I mean, he's, he's a prophet. He's a lawgiver. He's got a lot of things that he can do. Joshua is the general, and so we could say, well, Joshua went out and fought the battles. Right, but Moses, Moses was up on the hill praying. Remember the story of Aaron and Hur? 
And every time Joshua would go out to fight, Moses would say, here's how you go fight the battle, Joshua. And Joshua just had to follow Moses' instructions. But now Joshua had to seek the Lord and get the battle plan himself. He couldn't just check in with Moses. And so this could have been a disastrous moment because all these nations round about could have actually risen up and said, right, here's six million slaves waiting for us to take them. And so it's a, it's a risky moment, it's an unsettling moment, and I'm going to suggest to you that finding your purpose usually occurs in moments just like that. Just like that. So if you feel unsettled, if you feel off balance, if you feel like, I don't know which way to go, you're actually in a good posture to receive, as long as you don't do something really stupid. Because sometimes in moments like that, we get panicked. And we do things according to the flesh rather than according to the spirit. And if we do that, you might only get one chance at that. It's not that God won't forgive. That's not the issue. The issue is you might make a decision that is one way or another irrevocable. I see this one a lot with people who move out of California. I mean, I've, I've been alive long enough and living in California. I've watched lots of out migrations and people are like, that's it, I'm done with California. So whoosh, off they go to wherever the promised land is. And they get there and they're, they're gone usually just around a year, maybe 18 months. And they're writing back or calling, I don't like it here. I want to come back to California. And one of the things about California is for whatever reason, I'm not sure I know why, but, but our real estate always goes up. And so, you know, a year and a half, two years has gone by, and the same house they just sold is now 20% more, and they don't make 20% more money, and they're kind of locked out of the market. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Now, can God overcome that? He can. He can. But, but let's just be clear. There are some things you do that structurally just create huge deficits in your life. So you don't want to get in the flesh you don't want to get anxious. You don't want to make decisions that are expedient, but not actually the right ones in a time like that. And so God's about to bring life out of death for Joshua. And, uh, and he's not completely sure what all that's going to look like. Now, I don't know if you caught it when we read the passage, and I'll point this out again before we end the message, but um, there are three uh, chunks of this passage that we just read where the Lord is saying to Joshua be courageous, be strong, be brave be very strong, be very courageous, be not afraid why is he saying that? because when you're in that moment, when you're on the pivot point you tend to be very afraid <laughs> and so the Lord is speaking into the very human response but he's saying do not succumb to that do not let that overtake you. If you do, you will not break through unto purpose. Does that make sense? Okay, so with that all as backstage or background, um, let's talk about the times in which we live. We crossed a line of demarcation on the planet, the entire planet, in February. And this is August. So it's been six months. How many people know that we crossed a line of demarcation in February? A couple of tentative hands and nobody else. So let me explain to you why we crossed a line of demarcation. On February the 8th, the Asbury Revival broke out. Now, Asbury is an interesting place. It's named after Francis Asbury, whose statue currently stands in the Capitol Rotunda in Washington, D.C. And it probably will continue to do so until cancel culture catches up with it, and then it'll be pulled down and destroyed by whatever. But anyway, at the moment, it's in the Capitol Rotunda. Francis Asbury is reckoned by scholars to be the single most important preacher in the history of America. Now, that's saying a lot, because we could think of people like, say, Billy Graham or D.L. Moody, or we could think of people like George Whitfield or Jonathan Edwards or Timothy Dwight or whichever you know, major revivalist you might happen to like better than the ones I named. And I'm not particularly picking anyone out, but uh, you know, I didn't mention, say, William Seymour, and, and I could have. And I didn't mention um, Finney, Charles Finney, I could have. But anyway, um, and Asbury, Francis Asbury was a direct disciple of John Wesley. 
and he rode something like 150,000 miles on horseback all over America uh, in the early 19th century. And uh, Asbury Theological Seminary and now Asbury University, both of those were named after him. Um, being a disciple of John Wesley's, he was a, he was a Methodist and a holiness preacher. And uh, that institution named after him it has been known as a place that is a center of outpouring and revival ever since its founding. And in the 20th century, we're in the 21st century right now, just to make sure that we're all on the same page here. In the 20th century, the 1900s, the century in which many of us were born, in the 20th century, there were seven major outpourings of the Spirit at Asbury. Seven. For our purposes, we're only going to talk about one, and that's the one that happened in 1970. 1970. It was the seventh of the seven outpourings of the 20th century. There were, there were some in the 19th century, and uh, now we've had one this century in 2023, and it started on the 8th of February, the 8th of February. I don't know how many more there will be this century, but anyway, in the 20th century... There were the seven outpourings, and we're going to note that there was this one in 1970. Well, here in 2023, six months ago, um, there was an outpouring at Asbury. It was pretty widely reported. You guys are all revival junkies, so you would be familiar. You would have watched it on social media or maybe gotten yourself down there to participate in it for some amount of time. <clears throat> Well, that's one of, five, uh, one of, I'll say, five major events that, that clearly mark the line of demarcation that happened in February. The second major event of February was the win by the Kansas City Chiefs over, of all people, the Philadelphia Eagles. This was in Super Bowl 57 on the 12th of February, four days after the Asbury Revival started in the month of February, in the year of our Lord, 2023. I love the sound of that. We never say that anymore. In the year of our Lord. But anyway, what's prophetically significant about the, the Chiefs' win in February of this year? Well, a couple things are significant. Number one, they beat the Philadelphia Eagles. Does anybody know why Philadelphia is important? Because it's where the Declaration of Independence was signed, and it's where the Constitution was signed, and it's the seat of the First Continental Congress. So Philadelphia is the archetypal governmental city, and what happened is the Kansas City Chiefs beat them. We'll come back to the Kansas City Chiefs in just a second. Now, this was the second win that the Chiefs had had in the Super Bowl in three years, and none other than Bob Jones. Everybody here knows who Bob Jones is? Yeah, okay. Bob Jones had prophesied in just after 1970, which was the last win that the Chiefs had had of the Super Bowl up until the 2020 win of the Chiefs over the San Francisco 49ers. And what Bob had said right after the 1970 Super Bowl win was that uh, it would be many, many years until the Chiefs would win again. But when they did, it would be, there would be, a, there would be a sign by God that something had shifted, that the world was now different. And he said there will be two wins, and they won't be sequential, for those of you who think of, you know, was Donald Trump going to have two sequential terms or not? Bob specifically said they would not be sequential, but they would be close together. Well, 2020 was the first of the two. 2023 was the second of the two. In 2020, we were on the front end of COVID, and the, the Chiefs beat the San Francisco 49ers. What is the one single thing you think of when you think of San Francisco? Homosexuality. Okay? So, and Bob said, when the Kansas City Chiefs won again, God was calling his apostolic chiefs to the front, and they would stand forth. And then he said when the second win happened, he would be releasing his apostolic chiefs into the earth. That's what Bob said. Okay, so I've just given you the significance of two Super Bowl wins. And, of course, there had been a 50-year drought of Super Bowl wins for the Chiefs between 1970, which was when Asbury had its last major outpouring, 
and 2020 when they stand forth, but in 2023 they win again and you get another Asbury outpouring. Now friends, you could not make that happen. You cannot make this up. This is, it's very clear that this is signs on, in, on the earth, not in the heaven, but they are designed to get our attention. And so the Chiefs have now beaten not only the 49ers in 2020, but also the Philadelphia Eagles in 2023. Now the third major thing that happened in February happened 10 days after Super Bowl 57, and that was the release of the Jesus Revolution movie. And everybody in this room is nodding their heads, so you all went and saw it. And if you were like any red-blooded American Christian, you wept through the whole thing going, oh, God, do it again, do it again, do it again. <laughs> so I remember most of the places that are depicted in that movie because I was, I was in high school, but I was part of it. And I knew Lonnie Frisbee, and I traveled with him for about a year, and I know Greg Laurie. And, I mean, that's kind of my stomping ground. That's my backyard. And... Um, Anyway, the Jesus Revolution movie comes out, and the thing that is uh, actually pretty well documented by people in the know who are scholarly, but this is something that's a scholar's game. You wouldn't just know this without someone telling you otherwise. <clears throat> the thing that's interesting is the Asbury Revival of 1970 became like the subterranean river or the aquifer that the Jesus people movement drew upon. In other words, had there been no Asbury, there would have been no Jesus Revolution. And the same month that the Asbury Revival of the 21st century, the first one of the 20th century, 21st century, occurs, is the same month in which the Jesus Revolution movie was released. Again, you can't make this up. And just, I want you to think about something. If you understand business, if you understand the movie business in particular. You don't just launch a movie on a, on a pivot. It takes months of pre-programming what theaters are going to carry it and how long are they going to take it for and how much marketing is going to be spent on it and putting the trailers out and, I mean, all of the things that go with that. <coughs> and so the Jesus Revolution movie, they couldn't just say, oh, Asbury Revival's going on early in the month. Gee, let's pull the movie we made out of the can and launch the Jesus Revolution. That's not happening. And I'm saying it that way because there are so many people who want to dumb these things down and say, well, it's just coincidence. It's just the way it happened. And what I'm telling you is God was basically going, he's blowing the shofar so that all of America, all of the Western world, if they have eyes to see and ears to hear, would recognize what is going on. So we've got Asbury, and remember the last outpouring was in 1970, before the one that happened just a few months ago. We've got Super Bowl 57, which was preceded by Super Bowl 54, and we've got the Jesus Revolution movie, and all that went down in February. That's a line of demarcation. And if you understand the entire intention of this idea of the billion soul harvest, what this means is that the billion soul harvest has begun. And so for, for anybody in this room who's of a prophetic inclination or who's been part of anything revival oriented, for 40 years you have been here. It's an interesting number, isn't it? You have been hearing... Over and over again, God is about to, God is going to, there's going to be this great harvest, the revival's going to come, and on and on and on, and there have been stuff, but mostly it hasn't happened yet. And with that, a lot of us have grown older and fatter, our hair's gotten thinner, <laughs> right? We have aches and pains we didn't know we had. I mean, all these things are going on. And, and this is what had been going on. A generation had died in the wilderness waiting for something that had been promised to them. And on the one hand, they were believing for it. But actually what ends up happening is the promise that... Now I'm back in, in Joshua here. I'm moving back and forth between now and then. But I'm, I've gone back to the then for the moment. These people have been living in the wilderness, and some of their camps, if you, if you read the scriptures carefully, they were camped here for five years or seven years. They, they weren't just marching around the whole time. 
But they're living in the desert, and their last place of encampment is opposite Jericho on the east side of the Jordan River, and they've just been kind of camped out there on the plains of Moab. And, you know, when you've been living like that for a while, you know, the mamas in the, in the group, they've got their tent set up, but somewhere they went and found some, I don't know, desert iron wood or something, and, and they made shelves out of it, or maybe they stacked up some rocks in the tent, and here they got the little thingy that their kitties made, and just like moms do today, you know, they, it's like a painting on the wall or the craft that they made at school. They got all that stuff in their tent because they're trying to have some sense of home, some sense of stability. And they can look over and go, yeah, on the other side of the river, that's our promised land. We're going there, uh, but it's not now. And so what had happened is that over this generation that had come, the promised land had become fantasy land. And everybody could talk about it. Everybody could tell the stories. They could sing about it, shout about it, pray about it. They could prophesy about it. They were all talking their own version of revival. And we're going to go take that land. The Lord said it's a land flowing with milk and honey. He gave it to our father Abraham. Lo, these 500 years ago, we've been waiting for it for half a millennium. But you know, when that happens, after a while, people are like, yeah, we're over it. Everybody still talks the talk but they no longer have any fire in their bones. They've just sort of settled into this kind of predictability. And so, as difficult as these transitions can be, they are, or can be, opportunities. And so, here's a really important question. What turns a transitional period uh, into a period of increase? Or what turns a period of hardship, like the death of a mentor, like a, like a Moses, into an opportunity? And the difference lies between people with wishes and people with purposes. Right there. That's the, dis that's the distinguishing mark. Now, some people have wishes. Many people have wishes. I wish I had a better job. Uh, smaller waistline, more hair, uh, you know, whatever, a bigger house, a faster car, a, you know, just go right on down the line. I wish I had these things, but others have purposes. So what's the difference between someone with a wish and someone with a purpose? Well, those with a purpose have both an intention and a plan to achieve the purpose. Now, all the people in the room who are prophetic, your heads are exploding. Because most people who are prophetic think that the only real uh, stuff that's of God is stuff that's not planned and has no structure to it. And we just sort of get moved by the Spirit. It's like, ooh, I felt wind on that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we're going with that because Papa's here. And there's no, there's no real anything beyond that going on. But you know, when Moses built the tabernacle, that took some planning. They had to think about how big is this tabernacle going to be, and the Lord had shown them how big it needed to be. So how much cloth are we going to need? And by the way, where are we going to get that cloth out here in the desert? And who are we, who are we going to have build this tabernacle? Oh, we've got to get Bezalel and Aholiab. Okay, we've got those two guys. We know that they're skilled in the weaving and working with metals and whatnot. So we're going to put them to work. But now we've got to take up a big offering and get everybody to give metals and things so that they'd be materials to work with. And, uh, and then we've got to build these lavers and these basins and all this other stuff. So there's a lot of planning that went into building that tabernacle, which I think most, most intercessors and prophets would say is a highly prophetic structure. So if you're going to become a person <clears throat> who's breaking through to purpose, you need the intention and you need a plan. And if you don't have both, you're actually still living in fantasy land. You're actually just talking about what's going to happen rather than making things happen. Does that make sense? I mean, Paul wanted me to talk about breaking through into purpose, so I'm talking about what it takes. And I know I'm mowing down a lot of sacred cows, but it's okay. They're going to fire up the barbecue, and we're going to have a midnight hamburger fry out front, and it's going to be awesome. <laughs> so those with purpose have both an intention and a plan to achieve it. So what about you? Do you have purpose today, or I guess tonight, or do you have a wish? And if you're like most people, you have a wish but no purpose. And so we're going to talk about what that looks like in this context. So a generation of Israelites had been wishing for the promised land. And it, again, they can just look over and see, oh, there's our, there's our inheritance. 
but they actually they haven't crossed the river and until you cross the line of demarcation nothing actually gets activated nothing set into motion now here's the thing you dare not do it presumptuously so you'd still need to be led of the Lord but that line of demarcation is a really critical thing and for Joshua <clears throat> it had a twofold aspect to it one was the death of Moses we already covered that the other was actually crossing the river so that for them there was a physicality to it as well well for a lot of modern Christians revival and the idea of revival has become the equivalent of this promised land they wish for it but they have no purpose to find it or in finding it and they don't have a means of doing so and here's the thing with the Israelites back to the biblical story years before 40 to be exact they had been given a chance to enter the land of Canaan if we say it in Hebrew uh, but they had declined that chance why because their fears held them back they saw giants in the land and they said we're like grasshoppers in our own eyes we can't possibly take this land and there were only two men who said we can do it and one of them was Joshua the other one was Caleb but but they said yes we can and they basically were shouted down and they convinced the whole multitude to try and go back to Egypt and that was when the Lord said fine they'll die in the wilderness so here's the risk if you don't break through to purpose you will die in the wilderness your life will be futile you will be frustrated you'll be 60 or 70 years old and you'll feel like you wasted your life you know why because you did and you don't want that that's almost like a fate worse than death and by the way I do a lot of healing with people I'm known for that and you guys know that and I'm not saying it to brag I'm just noting that I spend a lot of time praying for people who need healing people who live in that state in their own personal wilderness that is defined by their un, un, inability and unwillingness to deal with their fears and these other things that hold them back and by the way unbelief is one of the big ones a denial of God and his promises all of that <clears throat> complex that we see in their lives this is often right in the center right in the dead center of diseases like cancer multiple sclerosis ALS Alzheimer's and other things that kill old people but Moses at 120 his strength was not diminished and his vigor was not abated and when Joshua was 110 he was all still out killing giants and he reaches the end of his life and they bury him where does it say in Timnath Haresh in the boundaries of his own inheritance because Joshua found his purpose and he took his land and he lived to be 110 and he was hale and hearty at 110 so you want to know why your bodies are breaking down why you're losing your minds why nothing's working it's because you are off target with your purpose you really need your purpose God wants you to find breakthrough and to live the blessed life but if you're living in unbelief if you're living in doubt if you're living in fear if you're living in un all of that stuff that will cause you to go into that that thing of decline in your old age does that make sense I know that's a hard thing to hear but somebody's got to say it sometime we yeah but Teresa we need more than to be strong we have to be purposeful because we're talking about breaking through unto purpose and if you have a if you have something you're aiming for if you have something you're you're targeting that's actually when <clears throat> you're at your best and a lot of times what people do is they say well you know I had my chance when I was 30 or 40 well that's actually another form of unbelief because Moses didn't really get going in his ministry until he was 80 and then he died at 120 and so again this whole concept that you know we've sort of come under and we don't even realize what a controlling paradigm it becomes it actually prevents us from achieving everything that God would have us to be in which is our highest and best and in it we find fulfillment it is he who gives you the power to get wealth it is he who will sustain you even into gray hairs and old age and I think a lot of us actually need to hear that message that's right <laughs> that's right you don't want to be old you can be aged but you don't want to be old right okay so for a lot of us this idea of revival has become the equivalent of this promised land idea 
and there's no purpose there. So the Israelites, as I said, they'd been given a chance. They declined it. The mothers and fathers had all died in the wilderness. But the calling remained because callings are familial and they're intergenerational. And now it was their turn. And while one generation was passing, another was rising. And in the midst of all that, Joshua nurtured the victory. Now, that's a really important concept to this idea of breakthrough. Joshua nurtured victory in his own heart and life. He waited, and when the moment came, when the commission was issued, he was actually ready. And Joshua succeeded where others did not because he had a different heart. And watch this, even though his circumstances were the same as those of his kinsmen. He's living in the same desert, in the same camp, in the same kind of tent, and he, okay, he's been Moses' number two guy, fair enough. You might say that's a better position. But, but still, the environment is not really any different. They're all living in the wilderness. They're all waiting for that thing called the promised land, and no one's getting there. But Joshua remembers, I saw the land when I went over 40 years before. I saw it, and it's burned into my memory banks, and I can't get it out of my mind. And I know God is good to his word, and what he promised he will give. And Caleb and I, we were the only ones who said, we can take them, let's go. And the Lord said, I will give you the land. But Joshua had to wait 40 years. And that's one of the things that God will do with us, is he will take us through a process whereby he forces us to wait. Because he's testing us. He's, he's, he knows the answer, but he's checking us and allowing us to check us and to see within ourselves <clears throat> whether we have the, how do I want to say this? Whether this is really something that's been born within us or are we just saying what everybody else was saying because it was the flavor of the month? And I think there's a lot of things that have come and gone in revival culture that are the flavor of the month. So his heart was different, even though he had identical circumstances. And so here's a question for you. Are you ready to become a Joshua tonight? Yes. Okay, we got one doughty soul. Yes. Now, great men and great women, that was a woman's voice, they rise above their circumstances by anchoring into God. What does it mean to anchor into God? Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. You let God become your obsession. You let the things of God define you. You let them mark how you make decisions. You, you make sure that you do not become worldly in your thinking or in your decision making by following the metrics and standards of this age and instead you find what's real in here and then you find ways to enflesh that in your own life. You are literally becoming an incarnationist and taking the calling of God and the ways of God and saying, I am going to live by this, come, no, come what may. And you may be mocked, you may be ridiculed, you could have a lot of things go on. Remember, Joshua and Caleb were shouted down by the ten spies and all the other people that they whipped up into a mob, and so they were sent away in this kind of sense of shame and defeat and despair, but Joshua, Joshua didn't, on the outside he may have been walking away like this, but on the inside he's like, you just wait, I'm going to outlast you guys. And when your bodies are in the desert, I'm going in and I'm killing some giants. That's what Joshua had in his heart. Now, great men and great women, they remain great even in obscurity. Now, that's hard to, to accept in a, in a world marked by celebrity culture. Because the whole point of celebrity culture is to be at the center of everybody's Instagram or Facebook and, and so forth. And, um, and unfortunately, the church has become marked by celebrity culture as well. And with that, we have a lot of uh, people that they're probably letting go of their inheritance that they should be tightly clinging to. Here are a couple of examples of people who remained great in obscurity. Joseph, number one. He had gone down to Egypt <clears throat> when he was 13 years old. That's what the scripture says. Excuse me, 17, my mistake, 17 years old. And when he gets there, he is purchased by a man named Potiphar, who's the captain of the Imperial Guard. It's sort of like, I guess, the modern U.S. equivalent would be the head of the Secret Service, except, of course, we don't have slavery, not legally anyway, in the United States today. 
but, but in those days they had it. And so Joseph gets purchased by this man, Potiphar, and it says that Potiphar ultimately, not day one, put Joseph over his entire household. Now, Joseph had some things going for him. He was a dreamer of dreams and an interpreter of dreams. And he obviously could hear from God. And I suppose he gained some solace and succor as he was in captivity because probably he continued having dreams. And we know for sure that when he's in prison after Potiphar's house, we know for sure he interprets at least two dreams for two servants of Pharaoh. Um, but, but Joshua, when he gets down to Egypt, okay, let's think about the things Joshua has to overcome. Number one, how about rejection? Because your brothers have sold you into slavery, and they honestly don't care if you live or die. It's, it's, they were ready to kill him, but you know, it's only because one brother spoke up and said, hey, let's, let's not do that. So they sell him into slavery. But later in the book of Genesis, it, it, it says he was distressed at the time. So you, know, you can imagine as he's being led away by these Ishmaelite traders being taken on the road towards Egypt, Joseph, his hands are tied. Hey, guys! Hey, I'm your brother! Come on! Come on, don't do this to me! Until they can't hear him anymore. That would give you a rejection complex. That would give you an abandonment complex. That would give you a need for some serious inner healing. He gets down there to Egypt, and he doesn't know any Egyptian. All he knows is Hebrew. And so he's got to learn Egyptian, and he's got to be kind of quick on his feet. He's got to be a little bit, we might say, wily. He's got to learn how to thrive in an environment that he doesn't know. Hostile people. He's got to learn how to make relationships. There's a lot going on here. Joseph's got a pretty steep learning curve as he gets sold into slavery. He's also used to being the favored son, and now he's just a slave. And so with that, I mean, doesn't really say specifically all that goes on, but in one particular psalm it says he was laid in iron. And, he, and fetters of iron hurt his ankles and his feet. And so at some point he was obviously restrained and enchained, and so he's got all of that going on. But anyway, some way, somehow in all of that, yes, there's favor with him, but, but he's got to be collaborating and co-laboring. That's what collaborate means. It's just a different pronunciation of the word labor, to co-laborate. So he's laboring with God, and in the faithfulness of what he does, eventually Potiphar says, it says he doesn't pay any attention to anything that goes on in his whole house. Now Potiphar's the captain of the imperial guard. He's, he's one of the nobility, and um, he's not as rich as Pharaoh, but he's not hurting. And so Joseph has actually, in the midst of a downgrade, gotten an upgrade. He finds the upgrade in the midst of the downgrade. What's the downgrade? Getting sold into slavery. What's the upgrade? Well, before he was the favored son in his father's tent, and he's a shepherd, but now he's in Egypt, which is at that time the height. It's like the New York City of, the, of its day. It's the, it's the seat of culture. It's everything. And he's down there, and he's now running a major household, and no one's really paying attention to him. So how did Joseph find part of his purpose? He found it by being industrious and faithful. And I think there's a lot of people that are looking to break through unto purpose. And if I can just be really blunt for the sake of saving some time, they're just darn lazy. They don't work hard. They don't put their hand to the plow. And they just think God's supposed to bless them because they're good looking and they showed up. Does this make sense? PDG just gave me a big grin. I just took a big burden off your shoulders, Brother Paul. <laughs> okay, so that's what Joseph is, is living in. And then Potiphar's wife goes, well, that's a fine strapping piece of young man flesh. I'd like some of that. Come lie with me. And he's like, no, no. I can't. And you know what's interesting? This is how you know Joseph is anchoring in God. What does he say to her? He doesn't say just no. He says, my master has put everything into my hand, into everything he has into my hand. Only you has he withheld. How could I sin against my master and against God? 
The God consciousness is there. The focus on the Lord in the midst of it all. Is he an embittered man who's like, oh, I don't want to serve the Lord. The Lord sold me short. I had the go. I had the magic robe with all the colors, and I was supposed to be the one. And God, you did me dirt. He's not doing that. But I've met a lot of people that that's what's in their heart, whether or not it ever comes out of their mouth. So you've got to have that intense focus on the Lord. And so Joseph says, I can't sin against my master, but I also can't sin against God. Well, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. And so one day she kind of corners him, and he runs away, leaves the garment, so he accuses him of rape, into the clink again. It's one thing to go down one time. He's kind of climbed his way up a bit, and now another descent into Pharaoh's prison. And again, we don't know all the particulars there, but I wouldn't want to imagine what goes on in an Egyptian prison, you know, roughly 1800 B.C. There's nothing like the Human Rights Commission or anything like that, right? So here he is. But again, Joseph doesn't become embittered, and Joseph is industrious. He puts his hand to something, and pretty soon, the prison warden, he's not paying any attention to anything because he's got Joseph running the prison, and he knows as long as Joseph's in charge, it's all going to go good. And so what are we seeing? We're seeing God giving blessing in the midst of a hellhole. God can give you blessing in the midst of hardship and difficulty, but you've got to be co-laboring with God. And again, it's not just let me show up and look good. And so Joseph is running now this huge complex, and in it he meets these two servants of Pharaoh. He interprets their dreams. The dreams are right. One dies. That's kind of a bad outcome, but it still was accurate. And the other one is restored. And as he's going, Joseph goes, hey, when you're restored, don't forget me. And he does. And so that was at age 28, because we know the scripture says he spends two more years in captivity because that guy doesn't remember him and so he now comes out at age 30 and he stands before Pharaoh God took him through a 13 year process from age 17 to 30 and now he stands before Pharaoh because now he's ready and probably he couldn't have been who he was without going through that 13 years even though it was hard and, and horrible because he was brash, he was braggadocious, he was inclined to snitch on his brothers and throw them under the bus. He didn't have any political instincts at all, but you sure have to build those fast when you're the minority culture living in a prison and who knows what goes on in that prison, but everybody's betraying everybody else and he finds his way to the top. Now that's somebody who's really got some EQ. That's another thing that many people who don't have purpose do not have is a sense of EQ. They don't know when to shut up. They don't know when to speak. They don't know how much to speak when they do speak. They don't know how to speak as it were only the very words of God. They just sort of natter on and, and it's just like, stop. I'm, I'm telling you major keys to getting through to your purpose. You may not realize it. I'm just telling you a story out of the Bible. But a lot of you came here wanting to know, how do I break through to purpose? And you thought I was going to tell you something easy. Well, you know, just get smacked by the anointing and it's all going to be great. No, there's a whole bunch that goes with it beyond that. And I already told you if you're aged, but not old, you can still become somebody of great purpose and, and value in the kingdom of God. So now Joseph comes out, he's 30 years old, and you want to talk about being on the burner. If it looked bad when you're running Potiphar's house and things go south, and then you end up in the Pharaoh's prison, what do you think it looks like when you're the number two ruler to Pharaoh, and you've told him you're going to have seven years of plenty before seven years of famine, and Pharaoh goes, you know, the Spirit of God is within you. Why don't you just take care of my problem for me? And now you've got to run the country and get ready for that famine. This is very much, you could lose your head, forget about being fired, if you screw up. And you're in a strange country, and, you know, you're given a woman for a wife. I guess that's better than not having a woman for a wife, maybe. But what if she's a spy? Because she's the daughter of the priest of On. And so... 
it's not really clear who's on your side and who's not. The only one you know is on your side is God. That one, that's unmistakable. So Joseph endures this 13 years of obscurity before he's raised up, and then once he's raised up, he's got a seven-year sprint to get ready for the famine. And once the famine hits, okay, now it's probably looking a lot better because the food's in the bank or in the storehouse, whatever. And, uh, and Pharaoh realizes, yeah, this guy actually did call it right. And so now he's got the favor that he needs. So Joseph overcame all of that. Here's another one, modern example, Winston Churchill. Now, he was the prime minister of Great Britain during the Second World War. But during the First World War, just about 100 years ago, Winston Churchill was the first Lord of the Admiralty, which effectively makes him like the Secretary of Defense in the England of that day, because Britain, as they say, ruled the waves. And the British Navy was everywhere and, and dominated the earth. It's not that the British Army didn't matter, it's that the British Navy was more important. And so Churchill, as the first Lord of the Admiralty, was responsible for the disastrous amphibious landing at a beach in Turkey called Gallipoli, in which the combined English, Australian, and New Zealander forces were more than 90% attrited because it was a failed landing and they were thrown back into the sea and most of them died and never returned home. And you can go study Gallipoli. There's plenty of uh, footage and books and other things about it if you have a desire to read about it. But it, it really embodies the carnage of war. And with it, Churchill was stripped of his rank and was sent home. And so he began tending vegetables in his vegetable garden. But great men remain great even in obscurity. Great men remain great even in obscurity, and so do great women. And so while he was tending vegetables, he was still nurturing a victory. And in the early 1920s, when Chamberlain, who was at the time the Prime Minister of Great Britain, flew to Berlin to meet with Adolf Hitler to sign a concordat of peace, and he returned to England, and there's plenty of pictures, you can look them up on the internet. He's standing on the deck of his DC-3. He holds up the document, and in those days, they didn't have jet bridges for planes, so you walk downstairs onto the runway or the tarmac. He's standing there on the, at the doorway of the DC-3. He holds it up. The press is all snapping pictures, and he says, we will have peace in our time. And Churchill said, prepare for war. And when Hitler invaded the Sudetenland, Czechoslovakia, and finally Poland on September 1st, 1939, and the war began in earnest, the Second World War, who did they summon out of obscurity become, to become the Prime Minister of Great Britain? Churchill. And what did Churchill, what's the most famous thing Churchill ever said? During the Battle of Britain, close, close. During the Battle of Britain in 1940, when the Luftwaffe was destroying London, and there's plenty of pictures of the flames leaping up around St. Paul's Cathedral, buildings all over London collapsing due to the Blitz. Churchill went on the radio and he said, I have nothing to offer you except blood, sweat, and tears. But if Britain should endure a thousand years, they will say, this was their finest hour. Now what does that have to do with breaking through to purpose? Never give up. Never, ever give up. If God has spoken to you, if God has put something into your heart, then you better darn well hold on to it. And you better darn well fight for it. And you better well, I mean, you could end up like Joseph, so you're allowed your moments of grief and sorrow, but you cannot let that overwhelm you into passivity. If you do, you are finished. And if you are God's person, here's what we know. If God is for us, who can be against us? Neither death nor life, angels nor demons, not even hell itself. In all things, we are more than conquerors. And so we have to have that intentional focus on God and that intentional focus on the mission that he has given us to fulfill. Well, that could be the whole sermon, but I'm going to give you six keys to Joshua's victory. Six keys to his victory that you can extract from this simple little story of 11 verses and that can help you 
find your own purpose and your own victory. Number one, Joshua realized his greatness in God. Now the scripture says we are all sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So Joshua marched into Canaan on the basis of a promise, and here's what it was. It came right out of the passage we read, but normally when we read a passage, unless we stop and comment on it, it sort of goes in one eye and out the other. It doesn't really sink in. But here's what God said in Joshua 1.3, Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon I have given to you. And so Joshua understood that God was giving him that land. Now, it wasn't for him, it was for the people, but nevertheless, he was going to partake in it. And Joshua did not see God's promises as being for others alone. He could have said, well, that was a word that the Lord gave to Moses, or that was a word that the Lord gave to Abraham, but I'm not Moses, I'm not Abraham, but Joshua didn't do that. He took that word and believed it when it was spoken to him. And so the Lord said that every place that Joshua put his foot would be his, and then he says, just as I promised Moses. So again, these things of God, they're durable, they're durative. And with that, we can grab a hold of them, but it's not enough just to claim it by faith, as people com commonly do. There's actually something that has to follow it up. There's, there's action required. It can't merely be a positive confession. Although there is a linkage between what we say and what we do, because when we say something, it tends to bind or obligate our actions, so they track the very things that we've spoken aloud. So Joshua came to understand, maybe not initially, but he got there, that Moses was not greater than he was. He was different, but he was not greater. And with that, the promises that God had given to Moses could be his, and he could actually start moving into those. And in fact, it remained for Joshua to walk into those promises. Why? Because Moses was no more. And the promise of the promised land had remained unfulfilled. So think of all the things that are in your family line. Think of all the things that are part of you. I'm not, you know, we always talk about like generational curses and iniquity and bondage. What about the positive things? What about the things that are part of your heritage, as, whether a Bostonian or a New Englander or, you know, whatever your family heritage is, the, the stories that maybe your grandparents told you on their knee that you hadn't really thought about or you dismissed because you've allowed the unbelief of the modern age to circulate around you and, and draw you into this kind of same complacency that I've been describing they had as they lived in their tents on the east side of the Jordan. Now the Bible tells us that with God all things are possible. That's Matthew 19, 26. It has a parable, parallel in Mark 10, 27. But the key word is the word with. So we often see the promises of God as narrowly restricted to those from another era. And it's easy for us to put up on a pedestal whoever they are, those great saints of the Bible or those heroes of faith from another uh, time, or maybe to uh, specific individuals we have known. But if this were all true, then how could the stories of their faith inspire us? Why would we even read the Bible to learn about these things if they're only available to those people that we read about? The, the whole purpose of, of the Bible, well, that might be too broad, but, but it is a true statement that one of the purposes of the Bible is to inspire our faith because it is not a book of exceptions, but a book of examples. So which examples in the Bible inspire you? I can remember as a kid, my grandmother would teach me stories of Goliath and David or Elijah and Mount Carmel, and I'd go, when do we get to do that? I want to call down fire from heaven. You know, when do I get to go kill a giant with a stone? I want to do that. And, you know, that's a little boy on the one hand. But, you know, it's a funny thing that, that whatever that was that attracted me there, now I'm in this ministry where, like, I see miracles all the time. And I, my book is about miracles that I've seen all over the world. And so somehow God was faithful to take that thing of me that rose up and said, I want that. And it looks a little different in my context. Or I'd probably be put in jail if I killed a giant with a stone. But, but the point is, I'm living a life of miracles, and there was something of that that rose up because I kept going toward it. Does that make sense? So think about those things that God has always been speaking to you about, that have always been in your heart. Because the Scripture says it's if you delight yourself in the Lord, Greta, he will give you the desires of your heart, which means, number one, he'll put the desires in your heart, but then he will fulfill the desires that he's put there. 
But that won't work if you think God's out to get you or he's mean or he's going to withhold or he's going to short you or whatever. That is not the God that we serve. With God, all things are possible, but the key word is with. If you are not with God, this won't work. And so when we are with God, the entire calculus of the universe changes and the impossible becomes possible. And so greatness in God is anchored in God, not in us. And so with that, one of the things I used to say all the time to the Australians, everywhere I'd go in that country, and I've decided I'm going to start using this line again, God spare us from the curse of low expectations. God spare us from that. You know, one time I went to this church and I was, I, I preached about some of the healings that we'd been seeing. And I made the comment in the sermon that from time to time, I didn't say it was all the time, but I said from time to time, we enter into this realm where we get 100 by 100 healing, which is to say 100% of the people we pray for get 100% healed. Everybody gets fully healed. And you tend to see it more outside the U.S. than in, but, but I've seen it at meetings in the United States here and there. And so anyway, I made mention of this, and afterward the pastor pulled me aside and he goes, I never want to hear you talk about that again in this church. And I said, why is that? And he said, because it raises people's expectations, and when it doesn't happen, they get disappointed. God spare us from the curse of low expectations. That's a curse when you live under that. What was, jo what was Joseph's expectation? That the sun, the moon, and the stars would bow down to him. And you know what? It happened. He got rebuked for it. People, you know, brothers were not happy with him, and even his own father was like, who do you think you are? You think your mother and I are going to bow down to you? But what actually ended up happening was exactly that. And so for some of you, you need to recover those dreams that God has put into your heart that have died out. Because, because often in your youth, but sometimes even in your adulthood, God will do things that will summon you into the greatness that he intended. And by greatness, I don't mean you're going to have a million social media followers and get asked to interview on Good Morning America. I mean, I guess it could happen, but, but think of your greatness as in God and doing his work, and then you won't fall into hubris. Does that make sense? All right, the second thing that gave Joshua victory is he understood that the promises made to others could actually be his. So the Lord told him this in verse 4, from this wilderness to the going down of the sun shall be your territory. Now what wilderness were they in? The wilderness below uh, Mount Nebo where Moses died in the plains of Moab. And it says to the going down of the sun. Now you don't have to go very far from the Jordan River until you come to the Mediterranean Sea. And the Mediterranean Sea is about 2,000 miles long in width. And at the far western end of the Mediterranean, not the shores that are by modern-day Jaffa and Tel Aviv, at the far end of the Mediterranean Sea, we come to what today is called the Straits of Gibraltar, but in those days they were known as the Pillars of Hercules. And when you sailed out beyond the Pillars of Hercules, you were in the Atlantic Ocean, but nobody really knew what was on the other side of the ocean. It was unexplored territory, at least to the, to the Middle Eastern and European minds. I mean, there were people living over here, yes, of course, but, but th these two were very distinct worlds that didn't really have much in common with each other. And so the Lord said, Joshua, from where you are, this wilderness now, to the going down of the sun, 2,000 miles distant. And with it, you have to the north, southern Europe, and to the south, northern Africa. So, Joshua, what do you want to take? Do you want to take Africa? Do you want to take Europe? Or, as the, as the passage talks about, you might even go to the river Euphrates, so you could swing around, head north, and then head east, and all the land of the Hittites, that's modern Turkey. And so God was saying, all of this is yours, Joshua. Which one is it going to be? And so the door of history was going to open at his touch, but in it, Joshua had to make some decisions. Now, he had to hear God, too. You don't just go make decisions. You pray, you consider, you wrestle it out. You come to whatever place of settlement you come to in your mind, in your spirit, as you say, okay, this is what God has given me to do. But now that you have that, you don't turn back. You go with it. 
But the Lord is saying, look, Joshua, this is way bigger than just this little piece of land that, that today we call Israel. This is the entirety of the known world at that time. That's what I have given you. And so remember this, Paul says in Christ Jesus, all of the promises of God are yes and amen. All of them. All of them. So did Joshua want Syria? Did he want Jordan? Did he want Turkey? Did he want Greece? Did he want Italy? Did he want Tunisia? Did he want Morocco? It sounds outrageous to us, but these are the very things that the Lord had promised to Abraham, as I said, about 500 years before. And so those very promises that had been given were now Joshua's to recover. And so what promises are you asking God for and whose victories have inspired you to ask for those promises? You probably need to vet those through, you know, pray them through. Lord, is this, is this of me or is this of you? But once you kind of get, get radar lock on, yeah, this is actually of the Lord. Okay, so what does that mean for me? What am I supposed to be going after? Do I need to learn a new skill? Do I need to get a new degree? Do I need to move? Do I need to whatever? I mean, I don't know what it is. Yours is yours. Mine is mine. But, but the point is, this is what Joshua had to do. And this is a critical part of breaking through to victory. <coughs> Brief pause. All right, the third thing. God can be with you as much as he is with anyone because God is no respecter of persons. But here's the counterpoint to that. That's a true statement, but there's an offsetting true statement as well. God is with those who are with him. So God's with you, but he's only with you when you are with him. In 2 Chronicles 15.2, there's a man named King Asa. He's one of the better kings of Judah, but he's not, he's not the best of them. But he's, he's one of the better ones. Mostly he serves the Lord, at least until he gets a little older, when he sort of gives up his purpose. And uh, at one point, King Asa is attacked by the king of Ethiopia. He's a man named King Zira. And Zira comes at him with one million troops and 300 iron chariots. And so Asa realizes this isn't good, so he summons what he's got in the kingdom of Judah, which consists of only two tribes, Benjamin and Judah. And so they, they gather who they can, and they end up with 600,000. So there's 600,000 against 1 million. That's, that's a little better than, a, uh, than being outmatched two to one, but, but not by a lot. And so he, um, Asa marches out with his 600,000 men to face 1 million Ethiopians and 300 iron chariots. This is all in Second Chronicles 15. And <clears throat> before he goes to war, he prays and he basically says, God, help us. We're outnumbered. We're not as good as they are. We don't have the weapons they have. But Lord, we rely on you. And he, he prays this unashamedly in front of the whole nation. Well, at that moment, Asa's purpose is what? Survival. It's, 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 it's not a very noble purpose, but as the king, that's his job. He has to defend the kingdom, the people in the kingdom, really. And it's not just to save his own throne. Sometimes people get that confused, too. So he prays this prayer. They go out and they liquidate the Ethiopians. And every single Ethiopian soldier is killed. None survive. And as they're coming back in victory... A man named Azariah, the son of Oded, meets them. It's the only place in the Bible that we hear of Azariah. But Azariah comes out to meet them, and he gives him a word. He says, hear the word of the Lord, King Asa, and all Judah and all Benjamin. That's a critical part of the, of the prophecy because it tells you it's not just for the king. It's for every man and every woman. It's all Judah, and it's all Benjamin. And this is the word of the Lord to you. I am with you, and you are with me. And you know, a lot of times people say, I can't find my purpose. God won't tell me what I'm supposed to do. God is with you when you are with him. So something is wrong in your spirituality where your heart is not aligned with God and his purposes. And because of that, God isn't talking. Or if he is, you're not hearing. And so if you're not getting that message from the Lord, go back and pray more. Well, how long do I have to pray? Until you get to breakthrough. We don't just pray to pray. We pray to have a relationship with God and hear his word. And so, with that, let's go back to the basic principle. God is with you as much as he is with anyone because God is no respecter of persons. But the Lord is with those who are with him. So, query, are you with God or are you just playing at it? 
Are you just going to church on Friday night because there's a speaker from out of town? Are you coming on the 15th of September because the great prophet from Africa is going to be here? Or are you doing this because you have a purpose that you're chasing down and you're trying to get activated and do something with it in your life before you die and turn to dust again? Amen. That's what we're supposed to be doing here. And if you'll seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, then everything else will be given to you. Everything else will fall into place. All that you need, all of your inui, that's a fancy word for boredom. All of, your, all of your anxiousness, all of your frustration, all of that's going to go away because you're going to be singularly focused on that one thing. Just like Curly said in City Slickers. All right, so Joshua had confidence that God was with him and that gave him initiative. And initiative is a key element of dynamic faith. Passivity is an indication that you do not have dynamic faith. So Smith Wigglesworth, the famous healing evangelist, once said that if the Holy Spirit wasn't moving, then he moved the Holy Spirit. Now that could sound pretty arrogant. Um, but what he really meant was if I go into a room that's filled with unbelief and a bunch of people that are like, you know, sticks on, uh, what do they say, sticks in the mud? If that's what I run into, then I'm going to figure out a way to get this room moving so that the Holy Spirit can do what the Holy Spirit wants to do. Wigglesworth had no, no illusions about what God wanted to do, but he knew there would at times be obstacles in his way in any given particular context. And so he says, if I run into those obstacles, I'm going to get rid of those obstacles. And with that, the Holy Spirit will move. And so working with God is a partnership. We wait on the Lord to receive his word, then we act on the word that we receive. And a lot of people are waiting for circumstances, but here's a reality. God is our circumstance. The Apostle Paul said this when he was preaching to a bunch of Greeks. He quoted one of their own poets, and he said, In him we live and move and have our being. So we said before, God is with us, or uh, with God all things are possible. We said that. But here's another reality. He isn't just with us. He is in us and around us. And right now there's a song that, that a lot of churches are singing. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I am surrounded by you. My reality is I live in you. I have my being in you. I breathe in you. And with that, I can take initiative in you. And when I take that initiative, you will back it as long as it's your initiative. Th these, are purpose, these are purpose questions. These are the things that will take you into that realm of fruitfulness and, and fulfillment. So previous faith leaders had shown Joshua this was the way it was. He'd watched Moses up close and personal for years. Ah, uh, we got a problem here. I uh, got an army coming, and uh, there's an ocean in front of us. Okay, just stretch out your arms over the sea. Take that rod, and what do you know? A wind comes up all day and all night, and suddenly you're able to march through. Joshua had seen that kind of initiative. And now it was his turn to step into it. It's, it's all well and good to tell the stories in Sunday school. It's another thing to grow up and become the Sunday school story. All right. So a deeply rooted belief in our culture, which is actually not, I mean, I'm going to make a word play here. It's a deeply rooted belief, but it's actually an indication. It's a root of unbelief, is that God is with some more than with others. But here's what the Lord said to Joshua. As I was with Moses, so I am with you. So let's swap it out a bit. As I was with, or as I am with Papa Che, so I am with you. As I was with Reinhard Bonnke, so I am with you. As I was with Billy Graham, John Wimber, so I am with you. As I am with David Hogan, so I am with you. Now, will it look the same? I don't know. It depends on your gifting. depends on your calling. It might look very similar if that's your calling. If you want to go hiking through the mountains of Mexico, dealing with drug lords, dodging, you know, cocaine traffickers, and finding people with their heads cut off and raising them from the dead by sticking their heads back on. Because that's what David Hogan does. He's raised over 90 people from the dead. One time he found 13 of them. They'd all been beheaded, and they were all laying out on the ground. And so they figured out which head belonged to which body. And they laid them adjacent to the bodies. This is literally a true story. And then they got a piece of tarp because they were like, we can't stand looking at this. And they threw the tarp over the bodies. And they went into the village, which wasn't very far. It was like, you know, here's the bodies and here's the village. But anyway, they go into the village. They buy some whatever you buy in a town like that for lunch. They eat lunch and they come back out. And th there's movement under the tarp, and they pull the tarp off, and all 13 heads had been reattached. That's a true story. 
That's a true story. That's a David Hogan resurrection story. 13 people. Well, if your calling is to march around in drug territory and deal with cocaine lords and deal with people who have been beheaded and live in all that heat and bugs and swamps and everything else, you just might have that gifting. But if your calling is to do something else, you don't really need that, do you? Nor would you have any place to even try it out. <laughs> I'm just saying. Now watch this. This is really important. You're going to miss this if you don't. So I'm, I'm, I'm cueing you. For him who has ears to hear, let him hear. The Lord said, as I was with Moses, I am with you. And he said, I will never leave you or forsake you. That's what he said to Joshua. The writer to the Hebrews, in round numbers, about 1,400 years later, in writing the letter to the Hebrews, puts in Hebrews 13, 5, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. The promise made to Joshua is your promise. God will never leave you or forsake you. God will never leave you or forsake you. As long as you're with God, God will be with you. And as long as you are doing that, you will start finding your purpose and you will break through into that purpose. And you will no longer just be sitting in a pew waiting for something to happen. You will be making things happen because you will be walking with the Lord. I mean, this is what we need. We need an army of activated people who say, this is the life I'm going to live. This is my best life. Does that make sense? All right, so number four, get a vision for what you are to do for God and then work to bring it about because in due season, Galatians 6, 9, we shall reap the harvest if we do not grow weary. So here's what we know. There is no victory without labor and struggle. Determination is built through trials and tribulations. This is why the book of James says, count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you experience various kinds of trials and tribulations. Lord, thank you so much for this new trial. It's a new opportunity to overcome. It's a new opportunity to find breakthrough. It's a new opportunity for me to find your strength in the midst of my weakness, and with that, to see your hand move. God, I thank you for this trial. How many of us pray that way? <laughs> Don't lie. <laughs> but, you know, the Apostle Paul says it is through many trials and tribulations that we enter into the kingdom of God. From the, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men and women lay hold of it. So here's the thing. You want to see the kingdom? You're going to work for it. It's not just going to fall in your lap. I know we have meetings sometimes where the Lord blows into the room and the room blows up and it's like, woohoo, those are great and they're celebration times. But when you're trying to advance the kingdom on the front lines in South Boston, when you're trying to see the kingdom of God come into Wellesley and you're watching all of those people who are so conceited and arrogant in their wealth and everybody's driving a Mercedes Benz or better and they think they don't need anything in the world, you are going to need some stick to to get through all of that. And by the way, the problems in South Boston are not that different from the problems in Wellesley, Massachusetts. But if you're going to be that person who brings the kingdom and who sees breakthrough happen, you are going to need some steel in your soul. And remember what I said? That in the King James Bible it says Joseph was laid in iron. So the Lord is going to work trials into your life on purpose, not because he doesn't love you, but because he needs you to be somebody with some steel in your spine. And most Christians in America have gone soft. We're better than Christians in a lot of other countries. I won't name which ones I'm thinking of right now, but a lot of them are just weak and lame and milk toast, and I wouldn't give you a quarter for all, for all of them. Because they don't do anything. They're just completely passive. And that is not who we are called to be. Does that make sense? So we enter the kingdom of God through trials. And when I think about that, I think of a man named George Washington Carver. He was an emancipated slave who was the son of slaves. And after, um, um, after Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation and the Civil War ended, <clears throat> he didn't really know much. He didn't have much. He was a slave. But he discovered the peanut. And he said he, you could preach the entire gospel out of, off of a peanut. And he went around, he was, a, he was a lay preacher, but he went around preaching the gospel by showing people a peanut. And he would, he would crack open a peanut, and he'd, he'd preach the gospel off a peanut. Yeah. Eventually he learned to read and did better than that, but, but that was his kind of opening thing. And 
So he discovered the peanut. All you people with peanut allergies, stop manifesting right now. <laughs> Trigger warning. Okay, so he discovers the peanut and he patents 205 different products off the peanut. One of which is peanut butter. We still use it to this day. It's just off patent now. And he makes so much money as an emancipated slave because of that initiative thing that we saw going on in Joseph. He makes so much money off of the peanut that he found something called Howard University. Not to be mistaken with Harvard University. <laughs> Howard University is to this day the largest all black, or primarily black now, institution of higher learning in the United States of America, and it is totally endowed by the money that George Washington Carver made 150 years ago off of his peanut empire as a slave. And I look at that and I think, man, oh man, oh man, most of us do not have those structural deficits in our lives that he had coming out of slavery. And if he could do that, what could we do? And so, what does the Lord say to Joshua? I mentioned this early on in the message. Number one, be strong and of good courage. Number two, that's verse six. Number two, verse seven, only be strong and very courageous. The one thing you got to do is be strong and courageous. And verse nine, third time, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid or dismayed. So David encouraged himself in the Lord, be still my soul. With God's help, we will overcome even this, whatever this is. So three times God exhorted Joshua to be strong and courageous. And he did it because considering what Joshua was facing, he could have easily been afraid and therefore not courageous. He could have felt weak. He may have wanted to run. Even though as a younger man, maybe he was ready to go in and fight. He probably felt overwhelmed. He's probably thinking, where's Moses? If only I had Moses to talk to right now, but I don't have Moses, and I'm not going to become a necromancer and channel him. And so most of the time when God calls us to something, it is going to be daunting. It is going to be hard. It's going to be bigger than you think you can do. But, you know, Bill Johnson says anything that you can do without God isn't worthy of him anyway. And so I'll tell you something. Based on a word that I was given in a meeting in 2011 at the front end of the Australian revival, I set out to do something that was at the time deemed to be ridiculous and impossible, which was to preach a ribbon of fire all the way around the perimeter of the Australian continent. And, and you know, most of those places, there are not airports. There's no airlift. So you're going on cars or bikes or foot and I went into aboriginal camps and little towns that most people had never heard of and cattle stations and this, that, and the other thing. And I just kept on going because somebody had walked up to me in a meeting and he said, you know, this morning as I was coming here, there's a man in my church. He's a very visionary man, very prophetic man. And he, he was in prayer and he called me just before I left the house. And he said, the man you're going to hear preach this morning I have a word for him. You need to deliver this word to that guy. Well, I was the guy that he was going to go hear. And so this visionary prophet guy, he said, um, I was praying and I saw something that looked like the old Bonanza TV show. I saw the map of Australia and I saw these pinpricks of light in all these places around the country and they kind of lit up and then the fire started to burn and then the fire merged and it became this continuous ribbon of fire around the whole country and as I was staring at the map I saw come up on the map burning letters 20 or burning numbers 2014 so this guy tells me this he goes what do you think that means I said it was 2011 I said I think we have three years to get ready and that was really the end of my corporate career because the Lord gave me this word and effectively pushed me into it. He said, okay, if you can see it, you can have it. But that doesn't mean it's just going to fall in your lap. If you want this, go get it. And so one of the things that I have been saying to people of late, and it's an, it's an old joke. Many people have, have heard this joke before. But I'm going to make it very pointed for us. When it comes to breakfast, who's more invested, the chicken or the pig? you got to become the pig. You want to see a revival? You want to find your purpose in life? You need to become the pig. 
You need to lay down your life. That's what Jesus said. He who would seek his life will lose it. But he who loses my, his life for my sake and the sake of the gospel will keep it unto eternal life. And this is why the American church is failing. And this is why most American Christians are bored. And this is why their Christianity isn't working for them. And then they get angry and frustrated. And I've just told you the answer to your problem right there. That was worth the whole price of admission. So the Lord exor um, exhorts Joshua to be strong and courageous. And I needed a kind of courage to go after this crazy word. I called Beth and I told her about it. And I was expecting her to do the wifely thing and say, you need to get home and take care of me and these kids. And she goes, that sounds like the Lord. You better go after it. This woman whom you gave me. <laughs> Anyway, Joshua's confidence was not based on mere belief. It was based on the fact that God was with him. God gave him confidence, and God can give us a similar kind of confidence. Now, again, I'm not saying go do something that's looney tunes and outrageous. Test words that you receive. But once you've acquired this word and you know you've got the mind of God, that's the one that you sell out like the pearl of great price and buy the field. And damn the torpedoes. Just t don't worry about all the other stuff because if you'll seek the kingdom, everything else will come to you. That's an ironclad promise of the Lord Jesus. All right, number five, we're almost done. Number five, remain centered on the word of God. The Lord said to Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart from out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? So God wanted Joshua, he said, to quote it and to have it frame his thinking. He said, where did it say that? Well, it shall not depart from out of your mouth. That means if it's in your mouth, you're speaking it, you're quoting it. All right, and then he says, and you shall meditate on it both day and night. That means it's framing your thinking. And I can tell you, when I was a much, much, much younger man with more hair and a smaller waistline, when I was a lot younger guy, all of the friends that I hung around with, we were all kind of the, you know, the male God squad or something. But, you know, we would constantly be talking about Scripture, and we would constantly be saying things like, well, I'm going to do this or I'm not going to do that because the Word of God says, da dee 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 That was the very nature of how we communicated. And one thing I've noticed with most of Western Christendom, I'm not just hammering away at America now. I've been to Europe twice this year, and I'm about ready to go to Jordan on Monday. And I've been, in, I've been on a couple of other continents already this year. Most of the Christians I meet anywhere in Western Christendom are not doing this. We don't quote the Word of God. We don't talk the Word of God. Everything's just a sort of vague, hand-waving thing. And we have lost that edge. And the Lord said, if you will do this, you will find good success. You want to know one of the reasons we're not finding good success? We are not centered enough in the Word of God. And you'll know if it's in your, heart, in your mind and in your heart if you're meditating on it because out of what's in the heart or the mind, either in this case, either one, it's out of the abundance of the mind, it's out of the abundance of the heart that the, say it, Teresa, the mouth speaks. So you'll know. Your mouth will be your best indicator. If all you're talking about is the Patriots or the Celtics or the Red Sox, depending on what season it is, <coughs> if all you're doing is talking about the grandkids or getting down to Cape Cod for the weekend, talking about the latest chowder, <laughs> if that's the only thing you're talking about, you have become worldly. And the Word of God is not framing your thinking. It's not driving you to heavenly realities. And we need to get back to that. That is one of the biggest, biggest detractors, negatives, missing pieces in Western Christendom, and I'm telling you, it is true from Korea clear across to Moscow. And it's true in India as well. There, there are pockets where it isn't true, but I'm speaking broad strokes. This is one of the big things that ails Western Christendom. God wanted Joshua quoting it and having it framing his thinking continuously. And here's what happens. What we speak creates implied obligation on us. It binds our actions to track our words. And so out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak, and therefore we begin to live and act out the very things that are in our hearts. 
And so what we meditate on, what we, what we dwell upon, affects our thinking. Could I suggest to some of you that you turn off the television completely and either turn on some audio Bible or read it for yourself an hour a night? You would be shocked at what a difference it would make in the way you are finding breakthrough and purpose in your life. So the goal was for Joshua that he would be careful to do to live out all that was written in it. Now note this, what Joshua had was Genesis to Deuteronomy. He didn't have the book of Joshua yet, he was busy living it. And he didn't have anything that came after that. We have 66 books to his five, and the Lord said if you'll just hang out in those five books, you will have good success in all that you do. What might we achieve? I'll tell you one thing that might happen. The entire of, I recognize there's some shortcomings, but all of the good that was, that was affected in what was once known as Christendom came about because people were meditating on the word of God, quoting it, and living it out. Yes. All of the good of Western civilization came about because of that one single thing. And we keep saying we need a new reformation, we want to convert a society, we'll let it begin with us, and that's how we do it. It's very simple. So, if he could get that far on the Pentateuch, I just wonder where we could get. So the word of God informs our actions. It keeps us from making wrong choices. And it creates faith in us so that we rise up and lay hold of what has been promised. Finally, expect a suddenly. So God can take whatever effort we have done or put in, and he can suddenly, as it were, put gas and fire on it or catalyze it. I don't care how you say it, but... Um, God gave little warning when it was time to march. He said to Joshua, within three days, you will go in and take possession of the land. Now, he didn't say in three days. He said within three days. That's a big difference. It could have happened six hours later or one day later or two. So it's a very short fuse. It's like, okay, I lit the fuse. You better be ready, Bubba, because now it's going to go. And so... Remember what I said, Israel had been living on the east side of the Jordan for a generation, and everything that they said they wanted had become somehow phantasmic. It was not real to them. It was, I don't know, it seemed kind of distant, and they, couldn't, they could see it, but they couldn't quite get their hand on it. And they were accustomed to thinking of the west side of the river, we might say, as, as fantasy land, or the sweet by and by. And now suddenly it was all coming together. They were about to cross over, but there was still plenty of hard work ahead. Suddenlies begin things. They do not end them. And here is what will happen. If you have these things lined up, you will find divine suddenlies will happen in your life. You don't know what they'll have to do with, but literally a suddenly will overtake you and you will have crossed the line of demarcation. You will not even know maybe even how and when it happened, but you'll know last week I was living that reality and this week I'm living this reality and what just happened? Well, you crossed the line of demarcation. Yeah. Now, I already told you at the start of this sermon that in February, this world, this planet crossed a line of demarcation. The billion soul harvest began in earnest. I talked to one friend of mine in Sydney, Australia at the end of February, and in two weeks, this is not somebody who goes around as a stage-based preacher. She does occasionally do that, but most of what she does is witness and work with people on the streets and preach one-to-one, -one, carry a Bible, talk to people, however she can draw them in, and get into a conversation. In two weeks, this single person this woman in Sydney, Australia, she led and baptized 600 people. 600 people in 14 days. Did she have a suddenly? Yeah, you better believe it. So when I was just in Australia three weeks ago, I spent some time with her, and I said, so what's your number now? I mean, you know, you, <laughs> at the end of February, you, you led to the Lord and baptized 600 people, and she said, Oh, I don't know. I kind of lost track at 6,000. I was like, that's what I like hearing. I can't even keep track of what's happening. Now, she clearly has an evangelistic tilt as opposed to maybe, I don't know, a deliverance tilt or a whatever. Fair enough. But the point is, she crossed a line. She took her inheritance. She's going after this thing, and the Lord is increasing her. And she knows her purpose, man. I'm going to win this nation to the Lord, or they're going to lock me up and kill me. 
But those are my only two outcomes. There is no other outcome. So she'd broken through unto purpose. Does that make sense? And everybody says, man, we want to see the lost one. We'll get out and preach on the streets. Or in the jails. Or in your neighborhood. Or, I don't know, there's lots of unsaved people. Just find somewhere. Hang out in Starbucks all day and share with every person who comes in. You'll end up with rot gut, but it'll be awesome. <laughs> What's the coffee place you like? Okay, go to George's then. <laughs> right. But you get the idea. You see, you see what I'm saying here. I'm trying to be a little bit funny. But anyway, suddenlies begin things. They do not end them. I think sometimes people just want to be able to say, hey, let me tell you about my awesome suddenly. Suddenly there was an angel. Well, suddenlies happen so God can pivot you into that next phase. And I'll just tell you, in my own life with Beth, uh, we've had three divine suddenlies that were major, like, you know, shifting uh, line of demarcation type events and literally for us it never took more than seven days in one case it was two days and in another case it was five but anyway bang bang the entire world changed and there was no looking back it was like the door slammed you couldn't go back if you wanted to and this was just our new new normal well God is lining up a whole bunch of suddenlies for people that that is on deck and so the Lord is moving around the world. I could give you many more stories of people with breakthroughs of various kinds. Um, there are prayer movements, fasts, overt evangelism, and many other things. Anyway, um, so it's time to cast off feelings of inferiority. You don't want to be like the Israelites who said, well, we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. No more grasshoppers here. God doesn't save grasshoppers. He saves humans. If you're sitting in this room tonight and you're born again, then you're part of this group that's been nominated and called. And no matter who a person may be, and you can name anybody you want to. We can name Cheon, we can name Bill Johnson, we can name Randy Clark. We can name, those are the, li well, those are the living. We can name the dead, John Wimber, Reinhard Bonnke, Billy Graham, whatever. All of them, their greatness lay in God. They anchored in God. They did the very things that I've been describing all night long. <clears throat> These are the very things that took Joshua over the river and caused him to succeed in subduing the land that had been given to the people because the same God who was with Moses was with Joshua and the same God who was with Joshua is with you and you have a scripture for it, Hebrews 13.5. The very thing that the Lord said he would do to Joshua is turned around, quoted to all Christians everywhere in the New Testament era. He will be with you. He will bless you. You will prevail. Go forth and conquer. Amen. The night is still young. <laughs> we want to... I didn't hear what you said. She said... I don't, it's okay, you don't have to repeat it. We want to take a moment and uh, receive an offering. We want to sow into uh, Ken, into Orbis, into this weekend. And uh, it's just part of what we do. There's just such an amazing dynamic that is released on radical generosity and so that is what we do so how do we do that this weekend um if you're making out checks you can just make them out to the bridge you can text the number no you can text to the number text bridge metro west to the number ninety four thousand. there you go it's not like i don't do this you know i don't know like 110 times a year um, so you could do that, or you can scan the QR code on the back of the chairs, whatever works for you. Cash works as well. Um, and this is what we do. It's, we could give you lots of crazy marketplace financial testimonies as well. But one thing that I learned growing up in the glory or whatever you want to call it in the word um, is to sow into what God is doing to sow in when God is moving. I, it's indescribable. And so it's an invitation for you to do that. If you're offended by that, that's okay. Uh, you'll get healed. And then just submit. See, you can't be offended by something that you've submitted by, unto God. If, you, if everything about you is submitted to him, then you begin to walk in an unoffendable lifestyle. And... Uh, 
I hate saying that because then every time I do, I, I get tested and I get offended by something. So <laughs> that's okay. We're being transformed from one level of glory to another level of glory. So Father God, we apply faith to what we give tonight. Somebody say faith. faith. Lord, and as we release authority of that which is in our hands, we place it in your hands. And we just say, go, Lord, your kingdom come, your will fully manifest on earth as it is in heaven. And according to your word, God, I come into agreement with what you're doing. And you are releasing that kingdom dynamic into this room in the midst of radical generosity. And so I speak the blessing of your word, the favor of the light of your face and your grace, and the power that proceeds from your mouth in this room right now. Bless each one, each gift, God. And I'm expecting a quick return because I just feel like that's what you're doing right now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Back to Ken. <laughs> well, I held you in rapt attention for one hour and 37 minutes. How about that? My timer went off at 50 minutes, but I was, <laughs> I, was uh, I was just getting near to the six principles. I guess I could have made that part two and saved myself a lot of work and just preach that tomorrow. But anyway, I didn't do that. So, um, <clears throat> So obviously this is, this is a message that is a, it's a summons, it's a call. <clears throat> and um, I just feel like one of the things that's going on in the times and seasons of the Lord right now, and this is, this is broadly true everywhere I'm going, I think it's, I think it's a thing within Western Christendom, um, the Lord is summoning people <clears throat> to their place. And, you know, whether you're 13 years old, you're 33 years old, or you're 93 years old, the Lord is calling you to your place. And there, there's some work that this involves, as I've said. I don't want to make it sound like it's just a cakewalk. Um, and it, it starts with just figuring out, okay, what am I supposed to be doing and getting the word of the Lord for you? But then once you've got that, you've got to put your hand to the plow and not look back. And so if you want to come up here tonight and essentially make a public declaration that you are going to go after the purpose that God has on your life, even if you don't know what it is yet, the point is you're making a commitment to figure it out with him. Uh, but then once you know it, to pursue it, that's the kind of force that will literally unleash a revival in this country. Because I think it's that kind of a force breaking through unto purpose that happened in the upper room on Pentecost. There were 120 of them at that time. And so things, things go pretty exponential right shortly after that. And that's really the kind of breakout that we're looking for. And if we should, by the grace of God, find ourselves in that, I can tell you what it looks like. Because when I was in Indonesia during the years that are covered in that book, uh, we had a number of times when we would visit particular islands. Indonesia is a nation of 3,000 islands. And uh, <clears throat> we would go to whatever XYZ island, and we would preach a meeting, and literally in a night, every single person on the island would be saved. There was nothing more to do other than disciple them. And so we were working with a church movement, and we'd leave a couple of people there to work with and disciple those new converts, and we'd go on to the next island and do some more of that. So how fast can it happen? Well, it could be a divine suddenly. You don't know how fast it can happen. Sometimes it'll be harder. You might be sent to the South Boston jail, and you might labor for you know, some years there. The point is, as long as you're faithful, you don't have to worry about what that rate is, just as long as you're doing your part, and then you just count on God to do his. So if you'd like to come up tonight and um, make a commitment to the purposes of God in your life, whether or not you know what they are, come on up and do that. And we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to release that to you. That's it. That's exactly it.
Let's go! <laughs> go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll keep the mic. That's the other thing. I think this kind of out loud praying is...